Um, welcome everybody, thank you for attending today. Um, so uh, my name is Anya Fisher and I'm the chair of the Central Southern Branch. Um, so today we're bringing you a, a, a sort of a first for us, a live Q&A um, session on property flood resilience. Um, and now this is, we've come, come off the back of the annual seminar we had last October, which was a three, three day digital series um, focusing on PFR. Um, and we had so many questions and interest around that session that we've decided to do uh, host another one um, with a bit more fluidity for people to um, ask questions away in the Q&A. Um, and we've got a panel of, of experts joining us today um, to, to try and answer some of those, those questions. Um, we've set the session up kind of in the same structure uh, as, as the, the titles of the, the series before, which was um, from PFR strategy to delivery, um, customer perspectives on PFR and overcoming PFR uh, delivery challenges. Um, we've got Alistair Chisholm from SIWEM who will be sort of chairing um, and yeah, diverting the questions between the, the panelists. Um, so yeah, we really encourage sort of uh, some, some engagement from you all uh, in, with the questions in the Q&A. Just note that you can also upvote other people's questions and comments if you, if you agree with that and want that answered. Um, just on housekeeping, this is being recorded. Um, so we ask that you sort of stay on mute and camera off uh, sort of and, and yeah, just right in the, in the chat box there. Um, it will be available on YouTube um, relatively shortly, hopefully after this, uh, this session. Um, trying to think what the housekeeping things there, there were. <laughs> oh, I can't remember any more housekeeping now. Um, and then just a couple of updates on SIWEM as things going on, um, just to raise awareness of flood and coast conference um, 7th to 9th of June uh, in Telford, the sort of usual place, um, and for SIWEMS uh, raising again awareness of their climate and ecological uh, declaration emergency um, that was the end of 2019 um, and that's still very, li very live and uh, Simon uh, sort of working on that um, and various events are tying in into that. Um, I'm just going to, oh sorry there is a housekeeping slide there, just to say yeah this is an hour of CPD uh, as, as well. Um, I'm just going to now quickly hand over to, uh, to Darren Eckford, who's the uh, Head of Learning Development at SIWEM, just say a couple of quick words about the, uh, the property flood resilience industry training that SIWEM have been, uh, been working on. Um, is, Darren, is Darren here? That's great. Thanks, Andrea. Yep, yep, thank I'm you. here. Um, please excuse uh, the croakiness of my voice, folks. I'm one of the many in the country at the moment battling the lurgy. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, yeah, just a quick update. Uh, SIWIM has designed and are currently delivering uh, PFR property resilience training. Uh, on that slide there, you can see that there is going to be a free session for all up the RMA network at the Flood and Coast event on the 7th. It's a full day of training uh, on the property flood resilience code of practice. We've been commissioned to deliver this training by the Environment Agency, and it's been designed in partnership with those organisations you can see there. If we can just flick to the next slide, you can see that uh, the foundation training, which gives the broad view of the PFR code of practice and how it should be implemented in, in context with the industry, uh, that is live uh, and there's available bookings now. And then there will be technical training launching for people working within property flood resilience on the six different standards of the code of practice. And you can see the dates that they are launching there. You can get in contact with us uh, via the website, the link at the bottom there, or email us and uh, we'll help put you in the right direction. Uh, a lot of what is discussed today, uh, this training will be very, very relevant to going forward. Great. Thanks, Darren. Um, I'm just going to pass over to uh, Alex now, the vice chair, um, to do the introductions for the, the panelists speaking today. Great. Thanks. Um, so as was mentioned, we're going to follow sort of roughly the structure that we adopted um, for the annual seminar last year. So that's three, three sort of 15 minute sessions. Alistair will be our chair for those sessions. Um, our panelists will probably chip into each of the sessions sort of however they see fit, but we've sort of roughly grouped them into um, three areas of, of focus. So for the first of our sessions, 
that's PFR strategy to delivery. We have Alistair Mosley, who's director at H2O WEM Limited and honorary vice chair of SciWEM. Catherine Grieg, head of transition at Flood Re, and Bev Adams, who's head of climate and catastrophe resilience at Marsh. Session two is on customer perspectives on PFR. Uh, so for that, we have David Kelly, he's a senior management consultant at Marsh. Mary Donau, who um, it's from Mary Donau Associates, um, was uh, sort of attended our previous call, and you'll have seen a lot of in the past. Uh, Alistair Mosley, director um, at H2O WEM, is going to um, chip into that session as well, too. And then we've got Phil Foxley, FCRM manager from the EA, who will um, contribute to that component. Our final session is on overcoming delivery challenges related to PFR. We have Matt Tandy, Associate De Director at AECOM. Um, we've got Fola Ogunwowe um, from TJ Consultancy. We were going to have Simon Crowther, who um, spoke at our um, PFR seminar, but he's on well today. Um, Phil Foxley might chip into that session as well, too. Um, so that's a really quick intro to the people that will be contributing to the panel sessions. Um, by way of sort of a bit of context to the first of those sessions, strategy and delivery, I think, Catherine, you just wanted to have a few words on build back better. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, with great excitement, uh, Flood Re has launched a Build Back Better scheme as of April 1st. This enables people who have a flood claim that are um, eligible or that have a uh, insurer who is signed up to the scheme, um, they will be eligible for up to a £10,000 additional um, monies to build back better. So uh, that would be for resilience and resistance measures above and beyond the value of the claim to put them back as they were. Um, the vision for this is that we know that the evidence shows that if it's well installed and to many thanks to the folks who were involved in launching the code of practice, the rigor with which PFR is being installed is really gaining momentum. Um, that though for homes that do install PFR, future claims will no doubt be shorter and even more importantly, people are out of their homes for fewer days. Um, next slide, please. I think that's the only one. Oh, no, sorry, ignore me. Yeah, there's another one. <laughs> yeah, so the key um, reasons for this, that it means families, as I said, are back in their homes in a matter of days. The offer is up to £10,000. Um, it gives homeowners a peace of mind that the next time it floods, their homes and lives are protected and reduces future flood insurance claims for the insurer. So both private and public benefits and you know a real success. Lots of people on this call have um, helped lay the groundwork for the launch and there will be a parliamentary event later in the month. And um, we are very excited that this will also nudge as we discuss in the consumer take up space, you know, more um, openness and thought about using these measures when people experience uh, flooding and insurance claims. So just wanted to highlight that as a innovative development in the UK market um, that took some time to get going, but is now here. Great, thanks very much, Catherine. So good, a good news story there. Um, I've got to say at the beginning as well, any anything that's mentioned uh, about Build Back Better and Cyworm, uh, other events, Barbara should be posting the um, links to these in the chat. And I believe there's a, was there a promotional video for Build Back Better um, and yeah, that will be, that will be next, shared. Yeah, it's already been posted there. It's an excellent yeah, great, great. Okay. okay. Right. So now we will hand. Oh no, that's the end. <laughs> we will hand over to uh, Alistair and and to you, the audience, um, with your with your questions um, on the first section, um, PFR strategy to delivery, um, and the first panelists. Um, so yeah, please don't be shy uh, in, in terms of questions, uh, comments, anything you know that comes to mind. Um, we really want this to be an interactive session um, and to, for all of us to get the, get the most out of it. So thank you. And I'll hand over to, to Alistair. Thanks very much, Anya. Um, yeah, everybody, please, please do start firing in the questions. We've got a couple to, to start with. And I think um, 
let's just stay on the um, build back better theme um, and, and just give Catherine and others, I think, a, a little bit more opportunity to um, really highlight how critical this um, point has been. It's, it's something that the industry has been calling for um, for a really long time now. Um, and, and something which I think has been a, a bit of a point of frustration, um, which is borne out uh, by the first question, which may now be partially answered um, by the existence of, of Build Back Better, but it, it relates to um, whether insurance companies were disincentivized from effectively building back better because customers were insurance customers were able to shop around and change their policies um, year on year. Uh, and, and really, how much does, does Build Back Better change that um, landscape? And, and I think in the context of um, shopping around, and, and I appreciate that probably because we haven't had the parliamentary launch yet, um, I understand we was fortunate enough to uh, attend the event earlier this week. Um, where the screening of the video that's shared in the chat um, was, was um, previewed, uh, there was a reference made to the fact that there are a number, a good number of insurers now um, getting behind the Build Back Better um, scheme. So how much is this a real game changer? Uh, I think this, this goes to, to Catherine and, and do questions around um, previous kind of blockers to to build back better, have those now been effectively blown out of the water? Is there anything else that we kind of need insurers to, to get more on board with, um, to just embed this, take it forward, really, really make progress on it as quickly as possible? Um, Catherine, if you can kick yeah, it so first, it, but then we get Alistair and Bev. Yeah, so in the first instance, I, I did position it as a real innovation, but it, in many cases, um, sort of zero cost resilient measures have been in place. And I know NFU in particular has been really strong on this. When you're putting down a new floor, you have an opportunity to choose a, a more or less thick carpet or no carpet at all. And those will perform differently as and when there's a subsequent flood. So in some sense, this isn't new and smart rebuilding will take into consideration the risk. On the other hand, it is absolutely industry, uh, industry first. And this is where there was some friction as to a core principle of insurance is to reinstate like for like. Otherwise you get into severe areas of fraud. Um, and and there, that is a huge issue across the industry. And, and we don't want people to make claims expecting that to um, enrich themselves. So what is new here is that the 10,000 pounds is being funded by flood re if the policy is ceded to us. So um, as and when, you know, the strategies and, and this is part of the strategy to deliver conversation Will we see a change in seating behavior by the insurers? I can imagine perhaps yes, um, so that we will see more policies just in the event that you get a claim and that 10,000 pounds is covered up, the, up to 10,000 pounds. I don't want to anchor on the 10,000 pounds because that is um, an area of pushback, frankly, from the industry. Um, and indeed, in some cases would be misspent money. So in some senses, the measures will be much, much less than the 10,000 and still be the most effective ones to do. Um, so is there more learning? Yes, we have poor data generally on many of the schemes that were put in place over the years by the EA and DEFRA and SEPA and others across the UK. Um, we don't have a good way to communicate to subsequent homeowners who may buy a home that has purchased um, a home that has done some resiliency. So in the worst instance, I've heard anecdotes about cat doors going into flood doors. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to enhance mechanisms for information transfer. 
we are moving forward on a number of initiatives to support that insofar as we're looking at a scoring mechanism to actually translate the effectiveness of the various measures um, to the homeowner so they understand this measure will get you an improvement of from an A to a, uh, from a C to a B or some sort of measure similar to an EPC, which brings me to the output of the scoring mechanism, which we envision as a flood performance certificate, very much alike um, the EPC. So lots more to do, but surely Build Back Better is a real stake in the ground to move this conversation forward and to recognize that we are no longer living in an environment of static risk. It's dynamic risk. It's unknown the extent to which it's going to be really harsh or not so harsh. And we're also sort of masters of our own destiny and the extent to which planning decisions today will impact surface water flooding tomorrow is definitely a area to watch. And we all know that surface, wa surface water is driven by sewer, sewer availability. And at the moment we have an automatic right to connect and other things that exacerbate those things. So this is part of a big, big conversation on how we make the UK more resilient, but certainly we're moving in the right direction. That's great. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so uh, I guess following on from that, I've got, uh, I guess, a question around where Build Back Better sits in relation to all the other moving parts that are part of this um, kind of journey from strategy to, to delivery. Um, and, you know, with, with Bev and, and Alistair, Bev, you're involved in um, the scoring project that should hopefully um, end up with a, a position where we have flood performance certificates. And Alistair, you've been very heavily involved with the code of practice. Um, <clears throat> You know, these things will all be mutually, um, hopefully, will, will all be mutually supportive uh, in, in driving in the right direction. Um, so how do those other factors combine with Build Back Better to, to end up um, giving the, ultimately the end user, the, the, the property owner or, or property occupier, a better outcome? Um, and if I maybe if I open that up to, to Bev, given that Catherine mentioned the scoring um, first. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Alistair. And thanks so much for inviting me to join. Um, while my role at Marsh means that I have a lot of access to what's happening with businesses and their issues with flooding, we also do a lot of work with Flood Re, um, <clears throat> and also, I guess, housing associations that maybe don't necessarily fall under the sort of banner of Flood Re. And so my job is actually head of climate resilience and strategy. And so I think one of the things I want to point out is that with the whole climate agenda, this must be seen as linking in with that. And so when we started the scoring project, um, we started with a hypothesis about the main drivers that were going to be helping us move from A to B in a more resilient world. And you've actually hit the nail on the head there that the buy-in from the insurance industry is absolutely critical to that. And this is the vehicle for doing it. What I would also counsel is that we took a lot of time speaking to mortgage lenders and businesses and other stakeholders, because for them, having a structured approach and a mechanism and almost the permission to do build back better or build back resilient has been really, really important. And so the scoring mechanism is a way of then tracking what's happened and giving credit. And so with this whole world of climate, you know, it's only going to become more, not less. And just to say the wider sort of shock waves outside of just insurability, we've had this whole new wave of climate reporting, which businesses have had to do. It's called TCFD. And so big banks, mortgage lenders, you know, uh, finance institutions, they're all doing it and they're all going, well, I now look at my portfolio and I have to quantify the flood risk today. I now have to quantify it tomorrow and in 10, 20, ooh, all the way up to 2100. Ah, right. But then how do I look at whether that's likely to lead to a homeowner defaulting on their mortgage? How do I know they're going to be able to cope with all of this? And that's where this build back better comes into play, because in an ideal world, 
This then drives good practice, it drives people being safer. And we always like to say, if you flood on Friday, how can you back up and running on Monday? And so it's that kind of living with water mindset, if you like. So to me, the code started the journey. And without the code, we didn't have a set of rules and regs. And it's not a standard, but it's a really good step on the way to a standard. Then having Build Back Better, that gives the permission with the policy piece. Then layer on top of that, the scoring to give credit where it's done and the data that naturally must be tracked. And I think it was um, somebody who just mentioned that it's been really hard tracking all these different schemes. But if we have the scoring, we have the tracking and therefore people can get credit for it. And so that to me, we're building it up layer by layer and it will benefit insurers. But by doing this, it will also benefit that wider wave of people, um, mortgage lenders, other businesses, and then ultimately the homeowner. And um, one thing that I would really strongly add, just, just to finish, is that the scoring, yes, it considers physical measures, but Mary will love me for this. The other part of it that's so important is the, the people's behaviour. And we have personal flood plans, we have flood emergency response plans. And so it must include a change and a recognition of that behaviour as well within the scoring. And so that's another thing that we've been working really hard to make sure it's what I would call that 360 wraparound approach to build back resilient because if nobody does the action they need to to put that door in place or to close off that thing then you know it's just not going to work and so I think for us whether it's homes whether it's businesses the both um, I think we've made a massive step forward and we have got more steps to go but this has been a solid really good bit of progress in the last three years. That's great thanks Bev. Um, Alistair have you got anything to chip in just on these um, points, because I think there's a, a question that's come in, which picks up on what Bev's just said, um, and also is really uh, relevant to one of the standards within the code of practice. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm gonna put it out there. Yeah, <laughs> I've go, 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 it, it up. I, I, um, and it relates to future maintenance and operation of, of PFR measures. Um, and, and uh, Trevor, one of our delegates, says that uh, he got a call the other day to say that a resident's equipment um, broke uh, and it, they didn't think it was their responsibility to fix it because presumably, it, well, maybe they installed it or maybe it was installed under a, a framework scheme or something like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's kit that was installed by an installer and therefore they were under the impression that it wasn't theirs to maintain. Um, how can we get around, hopefully build that better, leading to greater uptake of stuff, but that, that stuff working all the time? And what's the role of maintenance in that? If I, if I could just come in on that one, just, I mean, I could give Bev and, and Catherine a chance maybe to think, it, it, ultimately the homes are owned by the homeowner. And that, that has to be the understanding all along that there is now absolving responsibility in terms of maintaining the kit. I think it's really important that we do that, make that absolutely clear. Um, and I think the other the other thing just to say is that the maintenance is so important. You know, it's uh, this isn't a one time fix and it's all sorted. Um, everything needs maintaining. Absolutely everything in the home needs maintaining. If you leave it, you're in risk. And the the, the, the most obvious analogy is fire alarms. You know, you absolutely have to make sure you have your fire alarm service, change your batteries, keep on top of them because, you know, at some point they won't work when you need them to work. So well, those messages have to come through. And I think the, um, the the training side of things in terms of understanding how to maintain um, these things isn't only for the suppliers, but it's also for the homeowners as well. So the, the sort of courses that Simon are producing now, I think ultimately, Darren might correct me on this, will ultimately be aimed at helping homeowners as well realise what they've got to do to maintain um, their system. The one, the one word I um, wanted just to add is this: the, the code of practice and build back better, and all this is, is actually now empowering people to take a bit more control of their flood risk. But they do need to know, you know, the, um, the situation they're in to be able to do that effectively. That's why the training is so important, really, going forward. And also, so same for the suppliers as well. Make sure that they're giving the right advice when they're installing these things um, on properties. Fantastic. Thanks, uh, Alistair. I see Mary's um, popped her camera on, which I interpret to as uh, she has something to say uh, on this. Yeah. And, and Catherine, also, you, you popped yours on again. Uh, I think we're straying into the next session already, which is on customer perspectives, which is, you know, obviously 
um, has a lot to do with how the customer engages with all of all of these approaches and, and products. So, um, Mary, over to you. Well, I just really wanted to say that I took the floodmobile into a, a recently flooded community, and each person that I spoke to said that the PFR had failed. Um, and when I sort of dug into it, I found out that the the system that I happen to know is a very good one had been installed since uh, 2005 and none of the homeowners had known about maintenance or thought to maintain it and also they were kept in a variety of odd places outside where ma a mouse had eaten the rubber mm -hmm. seals in sheds in conservatories where the heat had um, will have certainly done degraded the, the rubber and that's why the um, code of practice is so important for the sort of the installer when he hands it over, hand things over to the homeowner, that those instructions are given. And I certainly agree with what Alistair's just said, that really we ought to be sort of reaching out to um, if there's a PFR, um, a wide scale community based PFR going that the perhaps a, sort of some degree of code of practice should be given to the community at large via Zoom, so they understand their roles and responsibilities, maintenance, and, and how to look after it. And I, that's a really good idea, Alistair. Thank you. Great, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Mary. Um, Catherine, did you want to? Was there anything you wanted to pick up on this? And and actually, from my perspective, you know, will there be a role for the insurers to help with this public communication side of it? Because obviously, they're a critical touch point with with people who have been impacted. Yeah, absolutely. And indeed, FloodRe sits behind the insurer. So we ha almost have no interaction with the actual consumer at all. Um, and I think, you know, for the community on this call, the extent to which you're actually involved in the installation to make these points that Mary and Alistair and Brev have all made so clearly that it, this isn't about a one shot situation it's an it's a living asset that like your car you need to go get the mot and you need to put the oil and you need to um do all those things that my husband thankfully takes care of <laughs> um so it, it is you know I, do we have a you know october 1st national resiliency drill day um, I could see us moving in that direction and it would be just sort of like mental health day. It's a check-in and are you prepared and are you, you know, up to the task as and when there's a flood? Great. Yeah, Bev, sorry, did you just pop your hand? No, I just want to say, Catherine, I absolutely applaud that idea the same way that I feel like as the growing um, momentum around climate builds, almost a kind of climate resilience day is how we should probably be beginning to think about it. <laughs> I think that's probably something that, um, you know, ourselves as, as CIWEM has a, a role in, in, you know, just building that awareness as well. And um, part of that, if any of the, the delegates at this event are coming along to Flood and Coast, then um, you might find out about some new products that are being developed uh, where, um, residents, users uh, can get helped to prepare, develop their flood plans, link them in with their PFR measures and, and, you know, almost really embed quite a structured process where they go through um, that MOT, that annual check and, and ensure that they're checked and they know how their kit is working and, and how to maintain it. Um, I just wonder, because we, we are now in, in the next little slot within um, the webinar, and I, I'd encourage um, panelists from the first session not to turn your uh, cameras off because I think we may as well just grow this pool as, as we go through the event but if we maybe we can um, invite Phil and, and David uh, to join I, you know this this whole concept of um, scoring and a, a flood performance certificate and, and the visibility and awareness of the issue how much is that um, almost another kind of real landmark in this um, sort of strategy to delivery process and how transformative do you think uh, as, as some of the guys behind developing that uh, that could be? I think 
Alistair, if I can, if I can offer um, a view on this, and I think um, we've been through the process, as, as others have said already today, of of you know looking at what's going on in the industry, pockets of good activity over the you know the previous decades, almost coming together and 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 allowing us to develop the the PFR code of practice, which was a real milestone, and and trying to tackle some of the issues around ownership, around responsibility, around maintenance, and indeed to, to reflect the ability of, of tenants, homeowners, to deploy measures, you know, to make sure that, that, that what's been specified is really practical. So we, we went through that process and, um, you know, by some of the, the comments and questions that have come through, we're, we're still in the process of embedding that into the industry, if you like, or within communities so that people clearly understand what their roles and responsibilities are and how to maintain and, and things like that. So that, that, that will continue to evolve. Where the scoring comes in um, is for me the next logical step forward because <clears throat> if you as a homeowner um, or a property owner are investing in PFR, so spending money, time, emotional content if you like and, and protecting your asset then that should be recognized in some way it should be recognized by you know through valuation through insurance perhaps um, but also a recognition of, of what's been installed and the uplift and performance that you should anticipate from that PFR should also be recognized but in a way which is consistent um, it's recognized by other stakeholders in the industry and indeed can be used to to perhaps even procure and specify other schemes in other locations or, or within other properties. So for me, it's it's a logical step forward. Um, it should hopefully start to not align with, but but be viewed in a similar way to an EPC, for example, when you know, there's been a lot of work done around energy performance certificates and how they add value to a property you know, based on um, you know, what people are looking for from an asset when, when they, they look to purchase or, or rent that. So this should move in the same direction. So it be it should be used to, as, as a means to 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 you know um, present value, added value to a property um, in, in the face of, of, of kind of flood risk. Great. Thanks, David. And and you touched on um, you touched on tenants there. And and we had some questions that came through in the previous uh, webinars around you know a lot of a lot of this stuff is is directed rightly at property owners um, and if we're talking about things like flood performance certificates and the touch points being when um, a property is, is bought and sold and that becomes visible then um, how do you or how do we engage tenants in all of this when you know they might not have the, the direct stake in it that the owners have um, is there a gap there that we need to be filling and if if there is how do we fill it i'll throw that open to the floor because it's uh, a tricky one that's all right it, it, it's mary um it is a tr an absolute tr tricky one um because you quite often find that uh, landlords aren't very engaged with with uh, rented properties and their flood resilience and some of them can be absolutely amazing particularly in SMEs but not necessarily at home at a home level and I think this is where perhaps a community group could come in useful um, one woman I, I interviewed actually said to me if only the flood group had knocked her door to say that her house had been flooded in the past she would have actually when she was doing all the previous building to it um, upgrading it she would have been great upgraded it in a in a resilient way um, so perhaps it is where the community could come in and say you know your home is at risk of flooding we know it's rented but there are some things you could do for instance as Bev, Bev said and something that's quite I'm quite passionate about is planning in advance you know moving your car moving your belongings and then letting them know that there are some cheaper options available to reduce their flood risk at a property level that perhaps wouldn't include major investment. And on my website, I've got something called uh, flood poverty. Really, if you haven't got the money, 
um, or your, your landlord won't invest, what can you do to reduce that risk? And that's the kind of information we, we should get out because we cannot overlook people who haven't got the money to install PFR and perhaps haven't even got the money to, to buy flood insurance. And they are the forgotten bit of the community, uh, at risk community that I think we ought to be reaching out to and find cheaper alternatives for them so they haven't got to be have their homes annihilated because they haven't got the money or the support from Floodry to, to build back better. Thanks, Mary. Um, and just to say that um, Barbara's popped the link to your, um, your Build Back Better case studies uh, document in, in the chat there. Um, David, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Charles. I mean, I think, yeah, echo Mary's, Mary's comments. And, but I think that the other avenue that's worth exploring here is looking for opportunities for adaptation. You know, people will upgrade their property based on, you know, we're having an energy cost crisis at the moment. There's a great deal of focus on making sure properties are well insulated, draft proofed, et cetera, et cetera. But when any form of maintenance, adaptation, refurbishment is, is being undertaken, that presents an opportunity for PFR. Um, and it's not a step, a, a massive step away from what people might be considering um, to address other issues within their property if they if they if they bring the resilience aspect into their decision making. So I think there's a, there's a piece around education around what resilience looks like for tenants, and also making sure that when there are opportunities for that adaptation to take place, that resilience plays a prominent part in that. Yeah, agreed. I, I just wonder if I can bring um, Catherine in on, on this. And as far as Build Back Better is concerned and, and the engagement with the insurers, how do um, homeowners get advice at that point where Build Back Better will kick in if they've been flooded and, and they've got a claim on which approaches are the most appropriate? Will that require engagement with the code of practice? Um, and kind of approved contractors and that kind of thing is, are there stipulations in terms of how Build Back Better can be applied or, or effectively is it sort of an open market? So in some sense to assuage the angst of the insurers, we've been very light on our prescriptive um, kind of guidance on the, on the one hand. On the other hand, we have best practices that we are suggesting and certainly the code of practice is a road that we are advocating for strongly. And we know that some of the insurers are issuing RFPs for support um, in this process. And we know of some of the respondees who are setting up infrastructure to support, you know, the decision-making all the way along, as well as the maintenance, as well as some of the things Bev mentioned in terms of um, flood readiness, and Alistair also alluded to these things as well. So um, we're at the early days, um, and I think we view it as a massive win to have had, you know, a few insurers sign up. We're really anticipating that the FOMO will kick in and those that haven't signed up will soon look like schmucks and we'll join them. That's all the technical knowledge you need. <laughs> but um, we, we, we wanna get the horses out the gate first before we tell people exactly how um, to ride, if you will. Um, and that's, that's, we feel like we've, we've gotten to this milestone and um, everyone wants to learn from what's done. And if we don't track what's gone into certain properties um, and how it performs and whether it's maintained, it's, it will be a lost opportunity. So, um, and I think that on the question at the start about retention of clients, you can imagine that somebody who has a really good experience of this will be more likely to retain their existing provider. So this is a opportunity for the insurers to differentiate themselves in that customer relationship. And I think there's been other um, reviews, the Blanc review in particular, that's looked at, you know, kind of the impact of switching and um, 
there's regulation that's been um, put in place by the FCA regarding you can't favorably price anymore for people who are new um, customers. So the churn will hopefully reduce just naturally in that regard. But I think this is an opportunity for the insurers to um, really raise their game. Great, thank you. Um, so Mary, you've got your hand up. I'm gonna invite you in one sec, but as I do, um, we're transitioning into delivery challenges. And I've got a question in my mind already that, that picks up on some of the earlier ones um, that relates back to what we've just been talking about. But if Fola and um, Alan, you've already popped yours on and, and Phil, you're in already. Um, so yeah, if you can kind of get ready. But um, Mary, you wanted to chip in. Really, I was following on from, from your question about the, a place for the code of practice. Absolutely there is, because unless loss adjusters, who actually are the guys that visit the home to assess the damage and decide what's, what's to be done in, in the repair process, unless they are up to speed with Build Back Better uh, and all the processes that are around it, then they won't be able to advise the homeowner who may not know much about it and also just flagging up, I think we've got very much got to change the hearts and minds of builders who often think, and I know from the many telephone calls I take, you do it my way <laughs> or um, and insisting we've always done it like this. So we've actually got to rind, uh, uh, reach out to builders. And I know uh, Scottish Flood Forum certainly agree with me that we've got you know, a big marketplace to change mindset of. And the code of practice to me seems an excellent uh, platform to, to do that. So I'm just putting more work your way, Alistair. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Alistair. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, to build on what Mary just said there, because this is one of the biggest challenges we have. We have a, a building industry that really does it, it's good that he's able to do what he does. You've got building regulations, but there's so much opportunity for builders to only want to do things their own way. We've got a big job to really persuade some of the building companies, particularly the smaller ones, the, of the merits of working to a code of practice. And equally, the designers, you mustn't forget the architects and the consultants out there. And uh, that was a big a strand, actually, of the, of the round table going forward is to, to really reach out to the um, professional and the construction community, they're still professionals, the whole building community, <clears throat> to, to really get them on board with what is basically best practice. That's all we've been saying all along the code of practice, best practice. And I, and I will also want to say that the insurance companies have been with us hand in hand all the way through this process. It's been so exciting. Uh, working right across all of these professions to, to really arrive where we are now and obviously build back better is the next fantastic step. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, Phil, you've got a, your hand up, but I just want to chuck in an, an extra dimension in, in case there's something else we can build on as well. A, a lot of this seems to be pointing towards the, um, the end user being becoming an increasingly intelligent client and increasingly informed about what their choices are, about what good practice looks like. Um, and I think in the current climate and it was sort of global climate, big part of that choice um, conundrum relates to the cost of stuff. And obviously Build Back Better offers a, a real leg up in, in that context. Um, but do, do you guys feel that there is any particular barrier that might come up around just kind of cost of living crisis, general increasing costs in building materials? I mean, I know this is something that in, in the flood risk management context, the, the cost of flood schemes is going through the roof because of materials and, and that kind of thing. How might that become a bit of a complicating factor uh, in terms of delivery when we get into the PFR space? But I'll go to you, Phil, first, because you, you had your hand up. I don't know if you want to yeah. comment on the latter piece as well, and then we'll come to Matt. Uh, just a small comment on the last piece. We're, we're fully aware that for our PFR schemes that costs are going up and we're working with our framework suppliers to, to understand those and, and what can be done. And I think the, the point I was going to raise is, is there is a the difference within PFR between the resistance elements and the recoverability elements. Uh, and when we're talking build books back better, a lot of that will be in the recoverability. So it might be raising electric sockets, putting in um, 
better flooring, rather than carpets. Kitchen, um, resistant kitchens like um, Alan and Mary and Paul have demonstrated in the Floodmobile. Those things are more likely to be builders. And once you mention builders, that's why I thought I'd jump in. But at the same time, we have um, specialists in the PFR to install the resistance measures. And it's something that needs to be worked through is that we might end up, and as you said, an intelligent client, that you have two different types of people, some delivering the recoverability and the build back better elements, and others who are delivering the um, resistance measures, the specialists who install doors, barriers, air bricks. Um, and you really wouldn't want the builders to start going into that and the PFR installers, you know, that's not their, their, uh, their specialism. You know, the local builders best to do one and the other. So I think all that needs to be worked through and understood, as you say, both by the clients who are the householders and from loss of justice and others. Great. Thanks, Phil. And of course, you know, in terms of that understanding amongst, amongst homeowners, then Mary, some of the stuff that you put out around your case studies is, is you know, great in terms of showing people what their options are and, and the kind of things that um they can put in and, and i think it was a couple of evenings ago you made the point that on average people change their kitchens what was it once every eight years or something so there's there's the opportunity to um try and get that engagement um yeah, a with the building actually, community and, just, and yeah. simple things like you live in a flood risk area you're changing your kitchen think about a flood resilient kitchen they don't cost that much more and they look just as beautiful if not more i've had severe kitchen envy visiting some of my people i've written about and i guess you know for for builders and in, installers who are generally working in those flood risk areas to get them more cognizant of the existence of, of demand for those kind of products and the existence of those kind of products is, is really important as well um i want to go to matt now because you've patiently been waiting with your hand up so that's okay, yeah. Um, I think just reflecting on a few of the things that have been mentioned throughout this particular session, but one thing that struck me from doing numerous of these sorts of schemes across England and also Scotland is around engagement and the importance of the engagement when we actually come around to getting these schemes to be successful and to get communities to be signed up uh, and understanding all of the things that we've been talking about, whether that's to do with maintenance, whether that's to do with how much things cost, whether that's to do with um, the importance of it. And the communities in which we work with and the makeup of those communities can be very influential in terms of how engaged they are different factors so some of the key things can be very simply has the community experienced any flooding before or is this a community that's identified at risk that can be very very different in terms of the approach which we need to take because those which have experienced the flooding particularly if it's been recent are very much more switched on engaged want to do something about it those are, and it's surprising how quickly we forget as humans. Um, you know, it doesn't take very long for that flood to have happened. We've cleaned up that people can um, uh, sort of put that to the back of their mind. Um, and those who, who have just been identified at risk, but perhaps haven't had the experience of it, they also need a very different approach to the engagement. Um, so that was certainly something I've reflected on. We've talked a lot around homeowners, but some of the work I've done over the last few years has been around small businesses and also the agricultural sector around how they manage their risk of flooding and what they can do to protect themselves. And they are very important sort of part of our societies that we shouldn't forget and they have a different kind of route and role and access to support as well in terms of resistance and resilience. Alistair, you did make a, be asked about um, the expense as all of these schemes, you know, we've seen that sort of increasing or I think things that have gone on in the world over the last couple of years, I think the easy answer is yes. Um, I think things have increased because of a number of factors. And I've been someone, uh, a sort of big advocate really for, for years around this idea around how much schemes cost, the 5,000 pounds it was that we had for some time. You know, um, if I'm completely honest, it's, it, I, think it's, I think that's 
sort of nonsense really it's not really a, a figure that's right when you consider all of the reality things that have to be brought in you've got consultants you've got the the people who do the surveying work you've got the experts who know around uh archaeology for example i mean i've been working on a project we've had ar archaeological problems and we want to put sump pumps in you know to property it's things that don't always jump out um we want about the storing perhaps of flood barriers we mentioned before that i think mary said or someone had mentioned around the seals uh, i think the seals had been nibbled by a rat or a mouse but where people are able to store them and community-based storage solutions all of these things take um, a lot of time and it's the importance of having the right people but the funding currently um is has been a little bit behind and i think we do need to reflect on what that is sure sure thanks matt um so phil yeah. you have yeah, your just hand jumped up. in there oh the sorry phil yeah yeah um i'm involved in a DEPRA project about reviewing previous um flood recovery grants i'm on the project board for that um i've raised the issue about the funding it's what's come out of the the initial questions as uh, with the public um, but obviously for flood recovery grants, that's where that £5,000 kicks in. We're, you know, we told that for everything you've said, Matt, we've got some evidence and uh, then looking at our own schemes, often our RFCCs are involved and their sort of figures that they're, there's inconsistency across the country, but they look more like seven and a half grand, but neither of them from the information we've got from the Solial scheme, you know, it's 10, 12, grand even higher for a large attached house so as the environment agency are very aware of the issue but they're not our first things yeah we need to build that evidence base and try to do that more on the schemes that have been delivered size of property the yeah how deep the flooding is can often be a problem the sources of flooding um listed status is also a thing in terms of the building because that needs a slightly mm. different approach resistance and recoverability measures um or is it, you know we need to think about as well those all have an influence and a, a broad brush of a particular figure um doesn't always quite fit mm. and there's a lot of backroom effort particularly for local authorities or the environment agency in managing these things and engaging there's a it's a real big amount of funding needed there to support that scheme Without wanting to take over the debate on this subject, you know, it's why I see it, it, the the backroom effort should be funded separately. The survey perhaps should be funded separately from the installation uh, because of the issue that, particularly with the recovery grants, the local authorities are reluctant because if the work doesn't go ahead, the cost ends with them or they try and put it on the householder at time when the householders are bit, uh, obviously short of money and stressed. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of things that should be improved that hopefully this project will tease out and we can get a sensible uh, solution. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Um, so we haven't got too much time left, but Fola had his hand up and Alan, you were trying to get our attention as well. So I'll bring Fola in first and then come to you, Alan. Um, that's OK, okay. All right. All right. All right. <coughs> a lot of what I was going to talk about on cost and stuff has been said and said quite rightly, so I won't repeat that. Uh, perhaps a few areas, again, that I feel uh, uh, could have helped. I mean, the code of practice, absolutely fantastic. Uh, but again, it, that was one of the recommendations of, of the roundtable and, and other things like, uh, you know, building regs. I mean, I remember, again, showing how long I've been in the industry. I mean, post 98, 2000 floods. I mean, there was a real big push with a lot of research I was involved with around 2000, 2001 uh, for the code of practice. And then DCLG was going to 2004. That was the big uh, update that was gonna deal with putting a lot of resilience things into the code. And around that time, it was, you know, this thinking of you know, we want less, less regulation, less regulation. And it's unbelievable. And up till now, there are just obvious things that people say, you know, why not? You still have, you know, the current code says you can put your sockets between 450 and 1200. So by putting it at 450 mil above the ground, you're following, you know, government practice. And there's so much, I think, while the code of practice really helps, but at a time when, you know, funding is squeezed and anytime people are really having to choose between doing things, you know, what you have to do and what looks like good to have, which isn't, you know, is a challenge. So I, I think, again, we shouldn't, we should just keep pushing that because there's, I mean, 
other countries are now picking, I mean, UK has been leading in, in, in this whole property resilience for the last 20 years. Other countries are now picking up on what we're doing and they're starting to put regulations in place. That means their buildings are actually doing what we've done the research for. And so oh, hopefully that's something, I mean, in essence, really mainstreaming this, it becomes the norm. You know, uh, and I think that's something which I think we need to put a bit of a thinking alongside. Again, just linking back to the funding. I mean, we, we've got, we know that, uh, you know, over the last 10 years, DEFRA has put a lot more focus on the resilience, you know, recoverability side of things. But, you know, I'm really looking forward to the update of, of, of the partnership funding, you know, for example, where, you know, there's been a lot of talk about that at the moment, you've still got, you know, only when you are, you know, you can only get funding for, you know, where you are significantly flood risk, you know, uh, you know, one in 20 year uh, standard in, 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 in all currency. Again, hopefully that's going to move up. Uh, but, but while that does that for, 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 for the, you know, where you apply flood, flood resistance, in terms of flood resilience, you still don't get outcome measure two for that. So we are wanting people to do this, but in terms of actually getting the benefit of being able to put it up screen, because you're not changing standard you're actually reducing the impact of that flooding it doesn't sit well still and i think again i'm really really hoping you know there's been the consultation and when that comes out that will actually be helping people to get that through more because if not you know we will you know it will only be when you've been flooded which is a challenge it's great for flood re and, and, and all the you know uh, grants to help where you've been flooded to get in a better place but we also need to focus more on things you can do before you get flooded. And, and yeah. that, those are the bits I think we're struggling with at the moment. I think that's a really important point, Fola, um, enabling the proactive stuff as well. I'm very conscious of time. Just going to see if, Alan, you can raise your point very quickly because um, you've been waiting patiently as well. And then we'll... No problem. Um, I completely agree with everything that's been said in regards to the increasing costs of delivering PFR. Um, but one point just quickly to make is regarding engagement and the cost of living crisis. And unfortunately, during the Oxcam PFR Pathfinder, we were given a bit of a, a sneak peek into the future and how homeowners will face this regarding SMEs. So while Mary and Fola were doing our community engagement, uh, Matt was doing our SME engagement. And there was huge issues with engaging with SMEs during the COVID crisis because they were battling to survive. So trying to discuss flooding when somebody's trying to keep their business alive and afloat was very, very difficult to have that conversation. And I can see when we're delivering our PFR scheme uh, during this summer in our new project, we will be facing similar um, objections and issues because of the cost of living crisis that people are now facing because people really have to prioritize every penny so it's something i think we need to consider uh, around engagement going forwards because we've got all the previous issues plus now the cost of living and people's prioritization yeah thanks alan i think that's that's really important as well um i mean i think over the past couple of years there's been some really great achievements and really great progress but clearly from what people have said today still an awful lot to do um, around a range of factors. So um, thanks every, everyone for your time. I'm gonna hand back to Anya now. Yeah, great, thanks Alistair. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for a, a really interesting uh, discussion. I feel like we could go on a lot longer than, than just this hour again. Um, but yes, yeah, thanks to the panelists for giving up their, their time. Um, and yeah, if anyone does any questions that they didn't raise during this and they would like, you know, answered later, feel free to get in contact with me. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for attending another Cyworm Central Southern Branch event and um, we shall see you at the next one. And uh, yeah, this will, this will be shared on, on YouTube um, shortly. So thanks very much everyone. And uh, yeah, we'll see you again soon.